Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another episode of The Financial Commute. I'm Chris Galeski, your host, joined by Portfolio Management Analyst Hunter Daniel. Hunter, thank you for joining us. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, Chris. So coming up on a decade of portfolio management and analyst experience, um, tell us a little bit about your journey. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my journey is a little bit non-traditional. Um, so I ran cross-country and track and field at Humboldt State University. Um, and I was fortunate enough to, to run uh, semi-professionally out of school. Um, I had um, basically a gear deal with the Brooks Running Company. Um, and so I didn't initially get a job right out of graduation. Um, nobody told me that that was pretty important to do um, <laughs> because it, it sets you up because graduating from college, um, I had a bachelor's in science and finance. I still didn't know anything. Yeah. I was keenly aware that I didn't know anything, um, but as you get further along um, in your career, um, you, you start to compete against lateral hires. Mm -hmm. um, so I identified that um, I wanted to really move into the financial world, and I knew there was a big presence um, in private wealth in Salt Lake City, Utah with Goldman Sachs. Yeah. And so I was still training out of um, Humboldt State at that time, and so I picked up and moved to Salt Lake. Nice. Um, it proved substantially harder getting into Goldman than I thought. Um, Goldman Sachs, on, it gets about 500,000 resumes a year. And that's they it? Hire, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they hire about 4%. Um, so it's, uh, it's very prestigious to work there. And I had a fantastic time there. That's where I began studying for the Chartered Financial Analyst exam. Yeah. Um, and that really ultimately led me from wanting to move within more of an operations presence to a portfolio management seat and really do the actual day-to-day -day trading um, and the asset allocation for uh, individual client portfolios. I really like the private wealth management as a whole, uh, the business, you could really see how you were helping clients. And so that was ultimately exciting for me, yeah. but I like the, the true quantitative, like nuts and bolts, like really looking at the different order types of that. So with that, um, I was very fortunate to land a job in, in San Diego um, and I was out there for about five years um, before I just didn't get to see the growth that I was looking for in my career. Yeah. Um, and Morton, just uh, we happened to, to come upon um, an opportunity. Um, you guys had some some people that the role opened up. Um, and so far, it's it's been the perfect fit. Well, we love having you here and you're instrumental in helping protect and grow our clients' nest eggs, not only from helping us deliver on the portfolio management side of things, but also the research. So as we're coming to a close for 2022 and heading out into 2023, the markets have changed dramatically. Stocks are going to kind of do what they're going to do. And they're down a little bit this year, but with all the growth that we saw last year, that's sort of normal. But the biggest change that we've seen is somewhat instrumental because it's been 15 years since you could earn any yield in fixed income that was attractive. Yeah. And so it's really important for us to reevaluate our fixed income, how we're protecting, generating income and gro growing my, um, uh, our clients' monies. But this year has been a really nice year to kind of reevaluate fixed income as a whole. Um, the Fed's looking to do some more rate hikes potentially, but tell me a little bit about the work that you've done here with us at Morton to help protect our clients and generate them in, generate income more recently when it comes to fixed income. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that there's two main things that we're really focusing on from the portfolio management perspective. Uh, the first one may seem obvious, but I'm not sure that everyone's as diligent with it. So we're really looking at cash yields. We're really trying to make sure our clients are in the highest bearing risk-free instruments. We wanna ensure they're safe. So on the treasury side, we're focused, um, or on the money market side, we're focused on, on treasury and, and purely highly high quality securities. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of clients that have different kind of funding needs or excess cash, um, we're out there actually buying T-bills or treasury bonds, depending on um, the duration for the clients. A lot of that we're buying in the three to six month range. Uh, the yield curve is very steep. Um, you know, you're, I was looking in the market today, you know, a three months is about 4.1. Um, and, you know, a six month is, you know, almost creeping up to 4.7. Um, so coming into, you know, the beginning of the year, uh, I don't know that I foresaw yields being like that. So that's relatively attractive for clients for parking short term safe. 
you know, the one thing to note is, you know, those do fluctuate. So the goal of investing in, in treasury securities to hold to maturity. Um, but if we have clients that have more uncertain funding needs, we're really trying to make sure that they're in high quality money market funds that, that hold that net asset value of a dollar for them. Yeah, thanks, Hunter. I think it's important. It's been, we've talked about this on some other episodes that, you know, cash is now an asset class. Yeah. And it hasn't been for quite some time. Uh, you and the investment team worked very diligently over the past month to reevaluate our current fixed income and come up with some new ideas. So tell me a little bit about that process that you guys go through to evaluate our managers, the amount of time and research that goes into um, choosing choosing new investments for our clients. Yeah, thanks for giving me that opportunity, Chris. I think that's one of the things that's really, really exciting here at Morin. We meet every Monday for an hour, the investment research team, and we're talking about everything that's going on and really, really trying to figure it out. Um, I know that you hear a lot in this industry that people just say they can't know. Mm -hmm. And I think that's fair. There's a lot of things that are hard to know and we can't know for certain, but I believe that it's our job to try. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I think just radiates through the halls here at Morton is people are trying to figure out, we're trying to do the best by our clients. And to stay on topic with the fixed income, the last month we actually scheduled a whole fixed income deep dive week. Um, we have, we've had six rate hikes year to date. I think that we're probably gonna have another, another one coming up, probably around the 50 basis point range, um, you know, but the market's moving, you know, Jay Powell could surprise us. Yeah. Um, but we interviewed seven different portfolio managers from prospective funds to funds that we're at, um, and we really want to get their understanding of where they're at from a macro perspective, you know, what kind of trades they're looking at and just what's attractive in the market with, you know, yields going higher. Yeah. Um, and coming out of that, we made two significant trades. Um, we'll be entering two new funds that we haven't used before um, that are really, really exciting. Uh, the, the real exciting part of it is, you know, they're going to have really strong yield to worst ratios. Um, Yield to worst means that's the interest that they're going to receive. Worst case scenario, if a, if a bond gets called early. Right? Exactly. That's absolutely right. So, you know, bonds can be issued as a, as a simple T-bill where the government doesn't have the ability to take that out of the market. They have to wait till it matures and they give the money back. But some typically, you know, municipals, different types of mortgage-backed securities, mm -hmm. you know, a client may that a piece of that mortgage-backed security, they may prepay their loan, they may um, decide that they want to sell the house that they're in and buy another house. Yeah. And so that basically refunds part of that. Yeah. And so the yield to worse is trying is an equation that we're trying to take that into account to really see, you know, in the scenarios that, that people prepay, you know, what, what a, what's a, it's a more true estimate of yield. And right. so it's more conservative. Here. Yeah, thank you for, for diving into that. I think we, we tend to use a lot of these terms right. and I just wanted to kind of explain what yield to worst, worst meant because there's the yield that you're expected to get, but yield to worst is the, the, the truer interest that, that you can earn. So thank you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And so with these two new fund managers, um, they're, they're both smaller in AUM. Um, one of them is about 190 million mm -hmm. and the other one's about 240. And we're really excited because we're going to be, you know, a reasonable part of that fund with the yields that have already hardened and increased. Um, in talking with those portfolio managers, they feel like this is a good time to be deploying capital. Um, you know, something really interesting that's going in the, the market right now, last week, Thursday, um, the Treasury ETF, TLT, the long duration is 20 plus years took in their second biggest day in AUM on Thursday. They took in 1.5 billion. No kidding. Um, the real, the, the yield curve is, is deeply inverted. You know, mm -hmm. you've got the, the, you know, like I was saying. Inverted means the, the shorter maturities have a higher yield than longer. Absolutely, maturities. that's exactly right. So you've got, you know, the six month right now, I was telling you, you know, four six to four seven, but going out to 10 years, you know, you're looking at three five to three six, and it's right. come down. It was it was closer to to four, you know, um, in later November, um, but it's come down. So, you know, if you're an investor and you're just thinking about it in simplistic terms, to lock up your money for ten years, you're actually getting one less percent than investing it for six for months. six months. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting. Now, we see 
a lot of people say, oh, just buy an index fund and like look the other way. What are some of the biggest risks that you see in investing in an index fund in the bond world and why we chose to go with active managers? Yeah, that's that's a really, really great question. So I think um, so you had Bruce Tyson on your podcast a few episodes ago, and I think he really laid it out well. Indexes for bonds, they have some inherent problems with them um, from a market weighting perspective. You're giving a highest weight to the companies that have the highest amount of debt. Yeah. Now, that may be a good thing because, because it provides operating leverage for the company, but they may be over indebted. And so in the fixed income space, that's why we're really focused on um, the active managers. And another thing to think about with that, too, is, is bonds don't trade every day. So they're inherently kind of an unliquid product, which doesn't necessarily lend it well to the creation and redemption process. That's a really, really um, unique factor of ETFs yeah, on the equity side, particularly the large, large cap companies that you know have very, very deep liquidity that, yeah. that market makers can can move in and out of. You think like Apple trades like 20 million shares a day or something. Crazy. Exactly. Yeah. So. yeah. And so, you know, they can basically, you know, they, it's a unique process within the ATF space to basically create and redeem shares. Um, and there's an arbitrage mechanism that authorized participants are able to basically take advantage of. And that keeps the price of the ETF and the underlying holdings, the net asset value, it keeps it very, very close. The majority of the ETFs that we trade have basically a one penny spread on each size. Um, and, and that's for pretty deep liquidity sizes. You know, we could be trading, you know, over a million dollars in notional value um, and I'm not moving the market. And so that just shows you how competitive it is on the equity side. Yeah. Um, but on the bond side, you know, the if a fund manager has significant outflows um, and they, you know, their, their ETF price could dislocate significantly than the net asset value right. because some of the underlying holdings, the, the bonds are not as liquid. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good point in the sense that bonds aren't as liquid as stocks. Everybody talks about using index funds or ETFs for low cost. And believe me, as an RIA, we care about the fees that our clients pay, but we also care about what the return is for them in their pocket. So using active for us to do internally. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I, I love the fact that not only do we reevaluate our investments on a very consistent basis, but we're willing to go in and spend real dedicated time on who we're currently working with, what's changed in the market, and what are some new investments that we might want to consider to help protect and grow our clients' assets. So, Hunter, thank you for, for that deep dive lesson on kind of some of the ways that you play an integral role to, to helping our clients. Yeah, my pleasure, Chris.